Hi, I'm Simon Cataldo, your state representative in the 14th Middlesex District, and this is The Whole Truth on Acton TV. There are two questions that I've received more than any other since being elected a year and a half ago. Number one, how are we going to fix the Route 2 rotary? And number two, what's going to happen at the former MCI Concord prison? Well, today we have joining us on the show two gentlemen who are working on the process for that redevelopment. I am so glad and grateful to be joined today by Commissioner Adam Bakey of the Department of Capital Asset Management and Maintenance. He's the commissioner, the head of that department for the state. And one other leader at that department, Paul Lillehaugen, who's a senior project, project manager at DCAM. Thank you so much, Commissioner Bakey and Paul, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So we're going to talk a little bit about this particular project that is so important in our district. But I just wanted to zoom out a little bit because I think folks are often really interested to know how somebody comes into the position that you currently occupy. So Commissioner, could you just start out by telling us a little bit about your professional background? Sure, um, and I, I doubt my path is necessarily typical of anyone. Um, and I've done a variety of different things that led me to this role. Um, I'm, I've been in the current role with DCAM for a little over a year now. Uh, prior to that, I spent a decade at UMass Lowell, uh, most of that time in charge of uh, real estate planning, design, and construction. Uh, and that was during a time of pretty significant growth of that campus. Uh, prior to that, I spent 14 years uh, at the city of Lowell, mostly as the assistant city manager for planning and development. And before that, I was a designer of uh, theater scenery, museum exhibits, and special events. So. Uh, well, it, that's, uh, it's, that's an eclectic and diverse <laughs> background. And what a bunch of people have remarked to me comes through in your work and how you've interacted with the community so far is that it is very clear that you have a background in municipal government which I think is so important for state bureaucrats of an agency like this one, because as we know, the relationship with Concord, with Acton, with local municipal leadership is foundational to everything that happens. And we're gonna get into that a little bit, but Paul, would you mind answering that question as well? Yeah, happy to. Um, Paul Lillehaugen, Senior Project Manager. I am an urban planner by training uh, with a background in the private and nonprofit sectors and now in the public sector. I've been with DCAM for about seven months now, so relatively relatively new. But before that, I spent several years with a private sector, small real estate and urban planning consulting firm, and before that with a global nonprofit working on long-term resilience strategies for cities. I worked across the US and Canada um, looking at the intersection of economic, uh, social, and environmental challenges that are so common across, across the world. Thanks, Paul. And I'll note for the viewers, if they don't know, that both of you are new during this administration. So you're coming uh, into this role and you've been uh, hit with this fairly big and certainly for our area, very consequential project. I think now in our region, a lot of people are hearing about DCAM for the first time. But in fact, DCAM does have a history of working in, for instance, the town of Concord uh, on past projects. So would you mind just giving a quick overview of some of the things that DCAM has been involved in in the recent past in Concord, for example, or in Chelmsford or Acton, Carlisle, wherever you want to <laughs> you want to start? Sure. Well, first, it may be useful for, for some to understand what a DCAM even is. Yes. Um, because I, I think it's not exactly one of the uh, high profile public parts of state government. Becoming so. <laughs> Although in Concord, <laughs> maybe. Uh, so we are very definitely a support agency. We are not um, you know, one of the agencies that provides direct services to constituents. We really, our role is to support all of those agencies in both the executive and the, the, um, the judicial branches of, of the government. Um, and actually to some degree the legislature as well. We are responsible for, uh, we, we actually own, um, other than for transportation, all of the state's property. Mm. And we are responsible for all the state's real estate activity, all the state's planning, design, construction of capital projects, um, and the redevelopment of surplus state property, which is what brings us to this opportunity in Concord. Um, and <clears throat> um, we've done, 
In virtually every community in the Commonwealth, there is some state-owned property that probably has involved DCAM in one form or another. Um, and we've frequently been involved in most communities in the, uh, if, if it's not currently in active use, like for example, the Concord District Court, um, we've been involved in processes to uh, facilitate the, the, the disposition and redevelopment of that property in one form or another. Um, and in Concord, there's a, a couple of properties that are actually in very close proximity to the site of the, well, now former MCI Concord facility. Um, there's a, a pretty significant piece of land uh, directly adjacent to it, which was conveyed uh, for uh, housing and open space purposes uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, I think it's um, turned into a fortuitous set of events that it has not been fully developed yet because now I think there's the opportunity to integrate that into the thinking about what happens with the larger site. Yes, and Commissioner, I'll just note that we'll put the map on the screen now and we'll highlight for the viewers the portion commonly known as Junction Village that is uh, connected to the MCI Concord mm -hmm. parcel. Great, great. Uh, I think there was another piece of property that was uh, conveyed uh, that it actually enabled the uh, construction of a parking lot and sort of a hub for the Bruce Freeman Trail and the, the local community park right there as well. So, yes, yeah. yes, and folks will know that colloquial, colloquially as Giro Park. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so um, I want to talk a little bit about how this plan or process came into being. And for those who aren't familiar, the governor, Maura Healy, came out with an announcement back in January of this year that the prison was going to be closing. And folks should know and understand that this is one of the major success stories in Massachusetts. We had far from uh, a capacity population at the MCI Concord prison. It was probably less than half of capacity. And that was a result of significant and landmark criminal justice reform legislation that had passed several years before and that we had been building upon to reduce incarceration, increase restorative justice practices, uh, increase uh, some of the resources that we knew were successful based on data and evidence for uh, reentry and uh, reconciliation. And all of that has led to uh, the closure of prisons, and in particular, the closure of this state prison. So we're only having this conversation because of those successes. And as a result, we're able to take a fresh look at this very interesting piece of state land. Now, this prison had been there since 1878. Uh, this prison had uh, been a part of this community, and uh, it, it had been integrated or not as integrated in many different ways. But the fact of the matter is the parcel itself uh, is at an incredibly interesting and unique portion of the town. It is uh, backs up to the MBTA station, more or less. Mm -hmm. It's right next to this other area that the commissioner mentioned that's zoned for affordable housing. It abuts the Route, Route 2 and the Route 2 Rotary. It's next to the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, which now goes, thanks to the state, all the way from Framingham to Lowell. Yep. And uh, so many people in our area, in Chelmsford, Carlisle, Concord, Acton, and many other communities use that not only for recreation, but for commuting. Mm -hmm. So this is an amazing piece of property. And uh, in the heart of West Concord, where I grew up, and you know, a lot of us have very uh, strong feelings about uh, what we would like to see there. Um, but all of that has to happen as a result of a process. And uh, in the interest of transparency and also helping educate people on how government works, I want to tell folks that the commissioner and I worked together to draft the legislation, the ultimate legislation that was signed into law. We worked together to figure out how we could have a nuanced and, and thoughtful um, uh, uh, bill that would give us enough dexterity uh, to have the flexibility we needed for all the things that would happen next, but also that would give the town of Concord and people in the area a really robust role in the future of this state land. So, Commissioner, I just wanted to ask you kind of what was that process like for you? What were you thinking about as we were going through that process in terms of helping set us up for success? 
Uh, well, for, first off, I guess I, I would like to just thank you for being um, such a fantastic collaborator on that. Oh, thank um, you. It's, uh, we, we get a variety of levels of engagement with the legislature on <laughs> topics like this, and, and uh, it's always a pleasure to be able to have such an open line of communication and a real kind of um, shared, recognizing shared objectives and a collaborative, cooperative process of, of developing something that will be practical and feasible. And, you know, in keeping with our, uh, our um, very strong posture as a support agency, um, we really feel that what's important here in drafting legislation is making sure that it, it will be effective to achieve the intent of the legislative champions, which I think we've really got here in, the, in a great, great example of that. Um, but also that in addition to supporting the state agencies that we have a, you know, official mandate to support and, and meet the needs of, uh, we feel very strongly that, and, and maybe this is my municipal background, I suppose, but we also feel very strongly that the actions of the state need to make sense for the communities where they're taking place. Um, and the, the residents of municipalities are also residents and, and constituents of, of state government as well. And, it, and the ideal process, the ideal opportunity for the redevelopment of a piece of property is something that engages the broad spectrum of stakeholders that, are, that have an interest in that property. And if we can collectively plan together and develop a shared vision that makes sense for everybody, that achieves state objectives but also and regional objectives, but also is consistent with the municipality's vision for, for it, we then can translate that into a process where we get the private sector involved from the development community. We get the, the, you know, the we work closely with the town to create the regulatory structure that, that the development can take place in. And all of those sort of steps are occurring in the context of a well-developed, well-conceived shared vision, which generally translates to an outcome where it's less about sort of battles and contention late in the process and, and more about just, you know, checking and confirming mm -hmm. that we are indeed moving in the direction we hope to. And really the, the place for constructive dialogue is in planning. And I think what we hope to do here and, and frankly in many places across the Commonwealth is create the right context and forum for that planning. Uh, I think I've said this in a number of forums. What I find particularly striking about working in this particular site with this particular community is the level of sophistication, engagement, and really thoughtful um, approach to that planning effort. Um, it's very easy for folks to just sort of position themselves as opponents or mm -hmm. look at a very simple, narrow view of what something, the impact of a project might be. We have not seen that in Concord. What we've seen in Concord is people who have a really robust, comprehensive understanding of what's good for the town of Concord and, and how an opportunity like this can support an incredibly broad range of goals for the community. So it's, it's really a pleasure to work in this community. Well, thank you for saying that. I'm very biased because I <laughs> love my constituents, but I completely agree with yeah. your characterization of them and the people on that committee. And I'll note that one of the only ways you can know that is because you've been on the ground in Concord and have made many visits at this point uh, to see the community. And you've also dispatched uh, leaders on your team like Paul to do that. So Paul, I thought I might just ask you kind of, can you tell us a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how this is playing out? Um, how is it going so far from yeah. your perspective uh, doing this kind of unique bespoke uh, procedure of interface that the commissioner and I wrote into the legislation um, between the state and the town and town organizations. Yeah, thank you. This is this is a unique bespoke piece that's very, I think, a very fun way to work as a as a state representative. You know, representative as a state uh, official. Like it's a, it's a really fun way to collaborate with the town. That um, the town is really coming to the table here. They're not waiting to see what happens and then come. The select board has put in place an advisory board of 10 residents that are specifically focused on this. They're having bi-weekly meetings in a public forum that people can come and talk and that they are all working collaboratively on getting a vision that the town, you know, a perspective that the town has on the future of this site. 
uh, we're in constant communication with town staff, with town elected officials from the select board, with members of the advisory board, uh, talking this all through. You know, DCAM is, as the commissioner said, the property owner here. We mm -hmm. have not had full control of the site. It's a it's a way that the the state kind of works. The DCAM owns the property and the agency that we are supporting does the operations, what's often known as care and control. So we're working closely with the Department of Corrections who is still on site, still in control of the site, still managing it, you know, taking a look at it very carefully right now, figuring out what components there might be able to be reutilized somewhere else, um, going through the records that are on site and you know, being very careful about the preservation and security um, of records of inmates who were there as well as records of employees and other sensitive topics on the site. You know, we're working very closely with them. We're working very closely with the town. We as you know, the property owner are doing a bunch of technical analyses on uh, engineering, on environmental considerations, on historic assets on site. We're also working with the town on community engagement, on kind of the broader scale planning. Uh, we had our first public hearing. Um, your your legislation uh, very rightly expected us to do um, a number of public hearings as well as engagement with key stakeholders. We had the first public hearing back on uh, September 12th. We had uh, 80 or so people in the room um, at the townhouse in Concord. We had another 165 on Zoom and we got more than 300 responses to a questionnaire that we had in both paper and digital format that night. Um, and this of, is for a small town, so <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot of engagement. And yeah. it's the first its the first opportunity. It's yeah. a really, um, you know, a strong signal to the commissioner's point about how interested people are, but how um, collaborative and willing to show up and ready to provide constructive ideas. And how did, you think it, how did you think it went? Um, besides obviously the great turnout, what were, what, was, what were your impressions leaving that public forum? We we were, um, I think, frankly, uh, really impressed, um, maybe shocked at how, <laughs> um, just how positive the dialogue and discourse was. And I mean, I, in, in a way, we shouldn't have been surprised because that's really been my experience with all the engagement I've had with anyone in Concord on this topic so far over the last, well, almost a year. Uh, but uh, it just was, we, we, we all came away thinking that was one of the best public hearings that we've ever participated in. Um, the, the, the turnout, the level of engagement, the nature of the engagement, the, the, the suggestions and ideas that were floated, the spirit in which they were floated, um, really all, we, we couldn't ask for a better um, sort of community participation engagement exercise, frankly. And I hope, I, no reason to believe it won't, and we look forward to this yeah. continuing. Well, we'll try to one-up it for the next <laughs> one, but it's also a credit to both DCAM and the town of Concord and several organizations in the town of Concord that really got the word out mm -hmm. about that public forum to make sure that it was accessible and, uh, and that people knew that they could come. Yep. Um, I want to make sure, Paul, because you, you mentioned ways that the community can get involved yeah. uh, in terms of reaching out. So just so that people first understand the structure, we obviously have our select board of elected officials. The select board has appointed a liaison to the advisory com committee for the redevelopment of the MCI Concord parcel, which is made up of 10 residents. Um, and those appointments have been made and they are meeting how often? Every, every other Monday at noon um, at the townhouse. And that meeting occurs in person, but it's also accessible via Zoom mm -hmm. on the town's website. So That's people right. can show up there live and they can also watch the recordings as I have. Either my legislative aide, Kyle Stapleton, or I attend each one of those meetings. And so I take it people can attend, they can give public comment, they can also write in, and I know this isn't your, uh, your uh, jurisdiction specifically, but they can write to the town uh, to give comment to the committee as well if they like to. We've got a lot of authors in Concord and, and <laughs> yes. Acton in yeah. the surrounding communities. Yep. Um, and uh, what else? What else can people yeah. do to, to learn about this? Yeah, so there are, there are a number of ways. As you said, there's in-person every other week at the Concord Townhouse. Um, there are also three subcommittees out of that that are meeting in public forum as well periodically. Um, 
there are ways to stay engaged digitally. The town has uh, web pages set up, the town of Concord has web pages set up for both the MCI Concord Advisory Board, um, where you can get information about those meetings and who's on it and how to be involved, as well as a separate site with uh, about the project more broadly that has FAQs and things like that and kind of keeps, is periodically updated by town staff. We at DCAM also have a project page that we um, identify. I'm not going to you know, try to read out the URLs, but hopefully we can drop those into yep. the comments we here. Great. We also do have at DCAM a uh, email set up that if folks want to get in touch with us directly, uh, that's MCI Concord Redev, R E D E V dot DCAM, D C A M M at mass.gov. Uh, reach out. We can, you know, you can provide comments that way, or we can put you on the mailing address, uh, mailing address list that we will continue to send information periodically throughout the project. Um, otherwise, pay attention in the bridge. I think there's been 30 or 40 articles in the bridge on this uh, this topic so At far. Least, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, definitely in the in the public eye there, and we will also have a series of additional um, public engagement opportunities over the coming months. Um, the town advisory board has a, is collaborating with others locally on a couple that are coming up here in November. Um, on November 1st, they're uh, working with the League of Women Voters of Concord Carlisle on a uh, public forum there on their first Friday event. I think the right. commissioner was there uh, some months ago talking about this. This is a yes, he was. He was a, he was a last minute uh, appearance <laughs> sitting in the back and. <laughs> That was uh, that was a, that was a great moment. I think actually in this whole process was when the commissioner showed up, um, kind of at the last minute, moved some things around, heard that this was happening, and he was there, and that really kicked things off in a really positive way. Yeah, I think there's also a meeting on November 18th with the Concord Climate Action Network um, that where we're going to be, or where the town is, the advisory board is uh, working with them, and then over the coming months there will be, you know additional forums, additional uh, public hearing, formal public hearings. Um, I anticipate a broader survey uh, that folks can take going out in the coming months. Um, so, you know, this is going to be, this is not something that's going to happen next week. This is going to be a year plus of additional planning um, that we'll be working very closely with the town throughout. And there will be opportunities for both in-person and digital engagement, um, chances to see where things are going and provide input throughout. So you basically baited me into the question of timing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about time timeline. What do we know? What do we not know? How is that going to work? Sure. Um, well, we do have a few, um, I think, that we, we created for ourselves with the legislation, some very specific milestones we need to meet about public hearings and, and reporting. Uh, but there also are some things that are going to drive this process that are frankly not known definitively. Uh, one of the most uh, immediate of those is exactly how long it will take the Department of Corrections to ensure that all the sensitive material that's on the property is removed from the property and it really is in a position where they can truly um, sort of divest themselves of the property. That will be a factor. Um, another very important factor is really we want to make sure that the state and the town um, are both ready for um, a vision-informed um, disposition process. Uh, I think in an ideal world, uh, we would even have the town having established the regulatory structure before we are actually soliciting a developer. So the developers know what they're getting into. And in lay terms, regulatory structure would include zoning? Would include zoning, yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe some subdivision um, in, uh, regulations as well, but predominantly it would be zoning. Okay. I think we're, we're hopeful that um, rather than simply saying, you know, in creating a zoning structure here that says, you know, these are the uses that are allowed and lots have to be this big, uh, that we might actually work with the town to develop something that's more form-based so that what, we, what emerges from the planning effort uh, can be actually codified. Mm -hmm. 
and we can help ensure, first off, that the developers we will then go out and try to recruit to, to be interested in this opportunity, and then those the, the developers who ultimately are responsible for executing, whoever is selected, really understand that vision and are prepared to build that vision. Hopefully the trade-off is that they have a pretty straightforward regulatory path and not a lot of risk if they actually um, uh, do conform to that vision. Um, and I think that's really the path that will get us uh, the greatest success. I think we, we're very fortunate in a place like Concord where the market is strong enough that I think we can do that. There are places where markets require a tremendous amount of subsidy to make much of anything happen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not one of those. Um, so I think this is a place where if we are art collectively articulating a, uh, a very rational and achievable vision, if we can translate that into, again, a, a zoning structure that um, ensures that that is what can be built, maybe nothing else, <laughs> uh, but also ensures that that can be built with a relatively smooth path, that's what's going to accelerate. And, and I know I'm circling back to not giving you an answer to exactly when this will happen, because there's a lot of pieces of that. There's a lot but in that there. Will, that's that what is, will make it yeah. happen the fastest. Yes. Um, and I think that's kind of the beauty of this process, that we are not putting the cart before the horse. We're making sure that whoever that developer is knows what the vision is, knows you know where the lines are and what can be done. And that's mm -hmm. the way to make this work in a way that's gonna really be beneficial to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I'm so grateful that you took the time to come again out to Acton and Concord and, uh, and visit with us um, and just continue to engage with members of the public about the objectives for what is probably the most important thing to happen to this little neck of the woods for many decades and maybe more. Um, there's so much upside opportunity here uh, and we have to get it right. So thank you so much uh, for coming, Commissioner Bakey, Paul, and uh, really looking forward to continuing to work with you in the future. Well, thank yeah. you as well. And we, as, a, as we've said, we really appreciate the collaboration at all levels here. Yeah, thank Great. you. All right, thank you. Okay. That's it for this episode of The Whole Truth with me, Simon Cataldo, your state representative in the 14th Middlesex District. Thank you so much for watching and be on the lookout for more episodes. <laughs> <laughs>